I wish to, to present you the panelists of this afternoon. And uh, we have uh, five distinguished panelists, as you can see, uh, Martin Disgang, Frau Kuzi, Jean-Antoine Giraud, Thomas Berger, and uh, Philippe Gourgoud. And now I want uh, to introduce uh, them a little bit more be before the, uh, the panel discussion on its own. So Professor Ma Martin Disgang, Disgang is a professor of neurology at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, in Germany. He is a president of the European Stroke Organization and he has been the chair of a scientific advisory board of Aeronet Neuron from 2016 until uh, last year. Uh, the second uh, 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 speaker in this afternoon session will be Professor Frau Zip. Uh, she has been director of the Department of Neurology at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz in Germany. And uh, she has been member of the board of different European committees especially uh, in neurology. And uh, since uh, January uh, 21 this year, she is the new chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of Neuron. So we, we have a past and the future of Neuron. Then after, we have uh, uh, Professor Jean-Antoine Giraud, and he is the current president of the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies. FENCE is the main organization for neuroscience research in Europe. And this uh, Pan-European Federation represents more than uh, 20,000 scientists uh, from at least uh, 33 countries in Europe. We have also uh, the Professor Thomas Berger, who is Professor of Neurology and Chair of Neurology at the Medical University of Vienna. He is a Chair of the European Academy of Neurology Scientific Committee. European Academy of Neurology represents more than 45,000 neurologists from 47 national societies. So as you can see, it's a very impressive federation. And, uh, and the last speaker is Professor Philippe Gorwood. Uh, he is head of the department and the Clinic des Maladies Mentales et de l'Encephale in the <coughs> saint -Anne Hospital, a famous place for psychiatry and he is the president of the European Psychiatrist Association. The APA represents more than 80,000 European psychiatrists from 44 national psychiatric associations. As you can see, our panel is balanced between the representative of, a, uh, of a ACB from Neuron and uh, from uh, professional associations. So now I will move to, uh, to, to the discussion and uh, I will ask uh, Anna to, to, give, uh, to give a slide to Martin. And uh, I will ask uh, Martin to present uh, the genesis of a neuron, uh, of a, of a neuron a, a strategic agenda. And I have a specific question for you. Can you, Martin, in less than 10 minutes, provide the audience with an overview on the scientific aspects of a scientific research agenda of neuron. And can you tell us what are the highest priorities for brain research in neurology and psychiatry? Please, it is up to you, Martin. You have about Thank you very minutes. much, Bernard. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah, that's great. So thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you again for uh, giving uh, the opportunity to present the strategic research agenda for the Aeronet Neuron for 2021 to 25. So for the coming uh, five years, you, you might have seen this graphic, which is from a policy view on the global burden of neurological diseases, translating evidence into policy that was published last year um, in the Lancet Neurology. These are uh, data on global health, so not just for Europe and for all neurological conditions, uh, including stroke here in dark blue, including um, Alzheimer's disease here in light blue, and also migraine in, in, in olive, just looking at disability adjusted life years here on the left, which is uh, the most important measure uh, in, from the uh, GBD, and further stratified according to age, as you can see down here. It gives you an idea of the challenges we are going to face as life expectancy goes up. And what you see here on the right is um, the proportional contribution to death, again, with stroke and AD taking very prominent uh, positions, not included in this graph, I should say, are psychiatric disorders. 
Now, uh, the Neuron Strategic Research Agenda for 2021-25 uh, creates a framework, and I think Marley has already outlined this, for funding collaborative research across Europe and for enabling activities with the aim to combat neurological and psychiatric uh, diseases. The development of this framework followed a structured process with contributions from multiple experts in the field, including those named down here in the field of neuroscience and involved two steps. So first, a structured questionnaire that was circulated to the extended scientific uh, <coughs> advisory board. And then second, in a second step, a face-to-face -face meeting at a workshop in Riga 2019. And the task of this effort, this exercise, was to identify barriers and uh, bottlenecks for research, spot emerging topics and opportunities, and eventually define priorities for research that help to shape future calls for research proposals. The overarching aim of this strategic research agenda is shown here and was to improve the understanding and treatment of nervous system disorders. And to accomplish this, the SRA defines three general um, scientific priorities, which are shown here, which is to understand disease progression, to understand these uh, mechanisms, to understand disease progression and interventions, including both prevention and treatment. These priorities focus on three groups of conditions, neurological diseases, psychiatric disorders, and sensory organ diseases, as well as disorders of the peripheral nervous system. I'll give a specific, uh, some specific examples in a minute. Now, in preparing for the agenda, there was a lively discussion among the SAB about hot topics and new priorities for the next funding period. If you look into the research agenda, you will notice there are eight um, boxes um, on topics that the group identified as uh, particularly uh, important and as priorities, including B-directional brain-body interactions with an emphasis on immune system and microbiota, then not surprisingly omics approaches and big data, but also smart data, not surprisingly artificial intelligence, then novel technologies, including for instance, tissue clearing, optogenetics and lipid imaging, and also research on non-neuronal cells. So what that means is microglia, for instance, oligodendroglia, but also vascular endothelial cells um, and parasites and so on. Then on the naturalistic uh, neuroscience and community-based, so uh, population-based clinical studies, then brain-machine interfaces, including the use of rehabilitation, their use for uh, rehabilitation, so to improve uh, means of rehabilitation, social stress, social connectedness, and also social status. And aside from defining these priorities, the agenda also highlights uh, bottlenecks key challenges and provides recommendations and possible solutions in uh, these various um, areas. Uh, let me just give you an example here in the field of omics and big data for neuroscience, neurology, and psychiatry. The need, uh, um, so, so basically what we emphasize here is the need to harmonize, store, and um, analyze data. Also the requirement to standardize methodology and technology and to invest in bioinformatics tools, which is, which is highlighted down here. And also the requirement to make use of artificial intelligence in analyzing multi-omics data. Much of this is very gener uh, generic. Personally, I think that accessibility and data sharing is exceedingly important as we see from, for example, from looking at the success of the UK Biobank. Now, what are the specific priorities for the next five years? So the next uh, years to come, as mentioned, the first priority is to understand disease mechanisms with the expected um, outcome to identify modifiable risk factors and novel targets for interventions, just to name two of those. And specific priorities, which are shown here always in the middle of these boxes, include development of um, preclinical models and also an improvement and validation of these models then uncovering disease and the mechanisms of resilience, so the ability to cope um, with pathology of disease or, or disease in general, then the understanding, uh, understanding the role of aging and comorbidity, which, uh, as you know, is exceedingly uh, common, particularly in the elderly population, then um, the, the mechanisms underlying multifactorial disease, properties unique to the nervous system, and also leveraging novel technologies. 
Just think of the opportunities that have emerged, for instance, and I'm giving one example here from clearing technology, which enables us to make entire organs, such as the mouse brain, which is shown here as a transparent organ, um, a, a completely accessible and um, where you can image the intact organ as a whole at an unprecedented scale, as is shown here on the right. Sidney Brenner once put it this way, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. So without doubt, new technology remains an important driver of research progress. Scientific priorities further uh, include um, here, as you see, making use of smart data and also um, uh, paving the ground for personalized medicine. With smart data, I mean, for instance, deeply phenotyped patients. Now moving to the next area, as mentioned, the second major topic is understanding disease progression with the expected outcomes shown over here to improve risk prediction, early diagnosis, predicting therapeutic response, and also early treatment. And the priorities are really to improve and develop biologically driven disease classifications. For instance, by classifying hereditary conditions based on the underlying genetic defects that are now widely known. To identify markers that predict disease res uh, therapeutic response and also understand diseases from a lifespan perspective. Finally, also to leverage novel methods for prognostic modeling, including the integration, for instance, of genomic scores, emerging risk factors, and information from neuroimaging. Now, the third and last topic, finally, is interventions. So promoting interventions with the expected outcomes shown over here to facilitate innovative therapeutic approaches, novel delivery systems, novel preventive strategies, and also optimized use of already available drugs. So basically a drug repurposing. I won't go through all these points just to highlight a few priorities include, for instance, the optimization or development of disease models for use in drug development and toxicity assays, then also optimized means um, of selecting and stratifying patients for clinical studies, optimized uh, means uh, also here again to develop disease models, then the identification of optimal time windows for treatment, for therapeutic interventions, and the investigation of means to leverage compensatory mechanisms for treatment approaches. Collectively, um, these priorities, I believe, define the framework for the development of future calls for collaborative research projects within ERANET Neuron. And just as a last point, aside from putting out joint transnational calls, Aeronet Neuron further aims to improve the general conditions for carrying out research and quality of research through a number of what we call enabling activities. This includes support of early career scientists, for instance, through exchange programs, summer and winter schools, workshops, and so on. Then data sharing. I mentioned on this already, not an easy task, as this also requires efforts to harmonize data sets partnership with industry, in particular small, medium enterprises, multidisciplinary research collaboration involving other disciplines such as engineering, and also capacity building, which is particularly relevant to countries with less funding opportunities. And I think uh, Mali's already mentioned on this. And finally, also the interaction with European initiatives such as Horizon 2020 and the Horizon Europe programs, uh, which are to come now. I think I'll stop here to leave room for discussion and, and thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this uh, very interesting introduction on the uh, research agenda of a neuron. So now I have a question for uh, Professor Frauke Zip. So Frauke, in, in view of the burden of, of brain disease and the size of the European community of researchers, the ERANET neuron and its action may seem a little bit very small level for action. So in your opinion, what can neuron bring that makes it absolutely essential in the European landscape of uh, neuroscience research? Thanks, Bernard. Um, and uh, thanks, Martin, for this uh, wonderful overview of uh, really important uh, topics in uh, neurosciences. Um, I, I uh, would like to uh, 
uh, say a few words uh, just so that you know my background as new uh, SAB chair. I was involved, as it was said already, in the um, previous uh, funding uh, period as member of the scientific advisory board. And I already witnessed uh, the interactive work and tremendous efforts by Malis uh, Dollerster and her team who initiated uh, the, this, this enterprise uh, together with our French colleagues, uh, Etienne and Bernard. Uh, and uh, I think it's now a very uh, good consolidation of this wonderful program in this um, uh, upcoming funding period. It has been achieved that uh, uh, Aranet Neuron is going on. Uh, certainly, uh, I would say um, we should, uh, this, this as introduction, we should um, already think about the future and uh, should think uh, how this approach may even lead to a bigger initiative within the European Union, given the, given the fact what Martin has also and uh, also Malis uh, has elucidated too that brain reserve or resilience and brain disorders are of utmost importance in the aging population. And um, my focus specifically, and this is my uh, perspective on, uh, on the whole, my focus is on neuroimmunology. I concentrate on neurological diseases and those healthy conditions uh, where the nervous system meets, so to speak, meets the immune system. And thus I'm very much used to include basic as well as patient oriented uh, research all of which is clinical research. And since I'm a clinician scientist and since scientific networks offer in principle the possibility of linking basic and patient work, I believe there is a unique opportunity of Ernet Neuron now to even foster more clinical research. <laughs> I think one has to discuss about um, a few points. So um, maybe even specific uh, dedicated translational funds. Uh, how would the evaluation be more for the uh, real clinical part and for the basic part? And um, certainly what I think is most important, what has been achieved already in the first funding period, but what should be fostered, um, I think is really to um, recruit young clinician scientists into these projects and um, to not let them move to the US, to keep them in Europe. And therefore, one has to come up with really very good ideas how to evaluate them. The very early young investigators, I think it's difficult to evaluate them uh, solely on um, impact factor papers and so on. So I think we have to discuss methods, how they could be integrated, how they could be uh, more uh, recruited into the whole program. And last but not least, I think certainly digital transformation has been mentioned, uh, certainly um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, interdisciplinarity is relevant, but I think what is also very relevant to foster um, neuroscience and clinical neuroscience is to really also publish this very good European idea prominently politically in order to make a bigger enterprise out of that, what Malis Dollerte has started, which I think is a very, very good, very, very good approach. And uh, last but not least, I, I thank you very much for uh, choosing me there. And I'm really looking forward to working with the Scientific Advisory Board uh, in this uh, uh, second funding period. Thank you, <clears throat> Frauke. Uh, I have a question of, uh, for Jean-Antoine. So, Jean-Antoine, 
So what are the recent advances in neuroscience in terms of knowledge, technological advances or new concepts that you think will have a major impact on our understanding of brain disease and uh, on their management? So can you open your microphone, Jean-Antoine? So is it working now? Should yeah. be? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you, Bernard. So um, and, uh, as you know, um, neuroscience is a, is a very broad area from uh, the most molecular to the most integrated and, and cognitive social neuroscience. And, and it's a very active field. So there are many, many areas. And so I, I will I pick a, a few examples to uh, answer your question. So what, uh, well, the first one is perhaps brain development. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, topic to understand how um, information coded in, uh, uh, in the DNA can give rise to a, such a complex organ as, uh, as the brain. And, and the progress has been very uh, um, fast and uh, very, um, uh, major progress over the last years, and that's very useful for understanding what are the risk factors for uh, uh, neurological and especially uh, a psychiatric disease as well, which can be uh, uh, the late manif manifestations, for example, in teenagers of uh, problems which occur during development. So this is a very um, uh, active uh, area with a, a lot of um, uh, um, uh, fallouts for um, uh, neuron preoccupations, including the interactions between genes and environment, because all this development is very sensitive to environmental um, uh, um, uh, alterations or uh, injuries. Um, a, a, sec a second aspect, which is uh, related in a way to development, is the, the amazing progress in cultivating uh, uh, human brain tissue, especially in the form of uh, induced plur pluripotent stem cells, which allow for the first time to study the properties of the human brain directly in vitro, something which was, of course, completely beyond reach uh, before. And that opens um, uh, uh, possibilities for studying disease mechanisms, but also um, uh, to test new med uh, med uh, therapeutic approaches and also uh, uh, in the uh, in the long run uh, to think about uh, possibilities for regenerative medicine as well. Um, and another area, many of these points have been already mentioned in, in uh, um, uh, Martin Dishkan's uh, presentation, general presentation. Another area which is also very active and um, uh, bringing a lot is the, the understanding of not only the precise anatomy of the brain, including uh, in the animal, but also in the, the human brain with um, uh, imaging techniques, uh, and also the functional anatomy to know how the circuits in the brain are activated and how they work and how they result in, 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 in behavior somehow. And th this is very important um, to understand the mechanisms of uh, uh, what's going wrong in disease, what are the mechanisms of symptoms, and also it can point to new approaches for treatment by uh, manipulating by brain stimulation, for example. And uh, um, uh, in this short time, I don't have uh, time to go into um, uh, many details, but I would like to also to emphasize the, the progress in um, uh, brain machine interface and in understanding how the brain works in terms of rhythms, in terms of being uh, able to make sense of brain activity, which is also very important for um, uh, um, uh, therapeutic interventions and um, uh, even um, bypassing sometimes the, the, um, the um, uh, injured nervous system, including for sensory disease, for example. And finally, just to uh, perhaps conclude, one, uh, one uh, to make the link with the rest of the body, which has already been mentioned by uh, also um, uh, Frau Kazip, this, um, uh, we've made a lot of progress in understanding the, uh, the role of interactions between the brain and the um, uh, immune system in the brain in, uh, um, in the inflammation not only for disease, but also just for um, uh, the normal development of brain. For example, um, the microbial cells, which were mentioned, which are um, um, 
innate immune cells, if you wish, in the, in the, in the brain, play a critical role in the development and the shaping of this organ. So this is also uh, something which has been extremely active. So, and I, I think at the interface between um, uh, neuroscience, neuro, uh, neurology and psychiatry, the neuron program has been already doing a lot and I expect it to be extremely active and very useful in the, in the next few years. I'm looking forward to um, seeing what's going to be done during the next years. Thank you, Jean-Antoine. So now I will move on uh, to, uh, to Professor Berger. So Professor Berger, can you tell us what are the highest priorities of brain research in neurology? Also, uh, this has been already addressed uh, by uh, Dr. Martin Dijgangs. And also in Infantfield, what are the areas of neurology in which you feel that an increased cooperation between basic and clinical researchers could rapidly lead to a new approach to neurological pathologies? Yes, first of all, merci for the uh, nice introduction. And also, I'm very grateful uh, to be uh, invited on behalf of the European Academy of Neurology. So um, I think that um, the current research strategies in clinical neurosciences are, let's say, prioritizing three main goals in a more, let's say, uh, generic way. The first would be uh, personalized neurology to provide a true individualization in terms of diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of our patients uh, with acute but probably even more uh, chronic neurological disorders. The second point would be, uh, um, I guess, uh, promotion of brain health and prevention of neurological disorders which uh, I think both urges also the respective literacy in parallel. And third, and uh, but not least, uh, and it was mentioned already, um, I think we need a better understanding of brain function, including brain development and maturation, because this is still uh, enigmatic in many domains and awaits still uh, a lot of discoveries. So um, having said that, I think that... Um, the collaboration between basic neuroscience and clinical neuroscience was driven historically by a kind of uh, divergence um, in the past, but this fortunately is now on the path of convergence. And I think this is driven by the mutual desire and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, important need uh, to use each other's expertise. Uh, to merge, and I think this has been mentioned already several times, uh, among others, the molecular, the, the genetic, the neuroimaging, um, but also the use of artificial intelligence with the diagnostic and therapeutic, and uh, at the end of the day, the most important uh, individual patient needs. Uh, and this joins forces for the utmost important goal, um, which means understanding neurological disorders and uh, I think uh, um, uh, much more important for the patient, uh, lesser the understanding, but the reduction of the individual and it, uh, also, of course, the social burden. And um, uh, finally, I would like to say that, however, despite this fact that this, uh, let's say, mutual understanding between basic neuroscience and clinical neuroscience, and also the meanwhile uh, uh, commitment seems very clear, um, we need very strong endeavors uh, uh, to make this uh, enable uh, to join the efforts in a very systematic approach rather than a mere individual, uh, which means a local academic uh, approach across Europe. And this, I think, would be one of the most important tasks in the near future. And uh, to echo what Frau Zipp said, I think apart from the scientific claims uh, and uh, questions, I think we need in parallel also the uh, appropriate education uh, of young neurologists and neuroscientists uh, to be also available for the scientific challenges in the future. Thank, thank you, Professor Berger. So I have a question now for, for Philippe, Professor Philip Gowood. So Philip, can you tell us 
what are uh, the highest priorities for brain research in psychiatry? And in that uh, domain, what are the areas of psychiatry where you feel that increased cooperation between basic and clinical researchers could lead to major breakthrough in the understanding of a pathophysiology of psychiatric disease and their stratification. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, for the question. Do we see me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So definitely, psychiatry had some delay, but I would really say that for the last decade, it had an incredible increase of the speed of discoveries and, and the understanding of what is mental disorder. Let, let me quote some kind of these results. The use of microbiota means a complete paradigm shift going to food, from food to brain through immunology. That was demonstrated for obesity, but now also for depression and anorexia nervosa. So that's really a different point of view. Functional MRI has been making a huge change also. You know, neurological disorders, really um, anatomical disorders. Psychiatry is more about functionality and especially the interaction between subcortical and cortical areas. And these kind of interactions are at the core of the mechanism of action of psychiatric disorders. We have also fantastic results for genetics and even more for epigenetics, where we can really reconciliate what does the environment on the subject and how that can be translated into mental health disorders. Uh, the other kind of re results that we can uh, discuss about is around the role of the surrounding directly on your mood. And where, for example, it was really recently shown that vegetation and green in your surrounding might have a protective effect on depression. And all of these aspects, they really focus on how we can even continue making progress on these aspects. Two things should be now developed in psychiatry and really to be really efficient in developing these aspects. The first one is having a global international biobank of brains. That makes a huge change in dementia. We're still lacking it except for a few countries. And if we can do so, there's a lot of difficulties to get there. And, and we might have a huge progress if we do that. And maybe the second one, just to finish my presentation, is to say that we need all those expert clinical centers to collect open access data. That was already mentioned. And I think that that would be an excellent way also to support a very good accuracy of information, not only about the patient, but also the surrounding and this being shared by everyone. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Philippe. So now uh, we are entering a, a new phases in this front table and uh, I will open the discussion between the panelists and uh, as uh, this is a virtual meeting, as you have seen, in order to, to facilitate the discussion, I've prepared some questions. Of course, you, the panelists, if you, you may ask others if you think it is uh, useful. So to, to start, I have a question for uh, Frau Kuzip and Martin uh, Dishkung, uh, and uh, you will see who will answer first. So are there breaks that prevent uh, the collaboration between basic neuroscientists and the clinical researchers? And uh, if there are, uh, what can do a neuron in that field? May I start, Martin? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. for sure. <laughs> So, so I think, um, yeah, I, I indicated already uh, one point. Um, I think it's always difficult to evaluate a basic uh, science uh, project and uh, projects and real clinical projects at the same time. Uh, by the same committee in the same uh, situation, one has to smartly find alternatives here since um, these, uh, uh, these approaches do really uh, need uh, very different uh, measures, not to say the one is, uh, has more value than the other. Um, that is one point. The other point is really that uh, a true, good, uh, large clinical investigations uh, need uh, much, much more uh, money than basic uh, projects. And I think one cannot uh, overcome this 
problem unless interacting, uh, cooperating with industry. Certainly, uh, all the European calls uh, where industry is part of, um, I don't know whether that works so well. So um, there have been uh, clear-cut conditions for industry, but I think one should think of really including industrial funds uh, into these translational uh, programs, calls, and then finally networks. Uh, maybe these are some of the points uh, I give to Martin. I mean, you covered it already, uh, Frauke, but uh, just to add one point, I, I'm increasingly concerned about the diverge between basic research and clinical research. And, uh, um, one, one point to make here is that, I mean, as we are witnessing now, basic research, in particular high quality basic research, is getting increasingly complex, demanding also in terms of resources, uh, also collaboration and technology, complex technology. So it's no longer about the simple ELISA or Western blot, uh, things that clinicians would immediately understand, but it's really major research efforts and, and endeavors that go on for years that are, by the way, also in many cases, very demanding in terms of resources, both financially and also if you think of the sequencing, RNA sequencing and, and personnel, and they take forever. Um, and that it's very difficult for clinicians, for clinician scientists to engage into this type of research, uh, particularly given time constraints and the burden, clinical burden they are facing. Um, I, I have no good solution to this, to be honest, but probably one approach would be at least, and I see this happening now, is to also invest in bringing medical scientists closer to the clinics. In other words, to enable people who are like biologists and biochemists who are working on disease-related research questions closer to the clinic, develop a more profound understanding of what, what uh, you know, true human disease is about and, and approach the, the problem from that side, also to keep the dialogue going. Thank you, Martin. So uh, since uh, the, the time is, uh, is running very fast, uh, I will skip uh, some quick of uh, a question that I've prepared. And I have a question for Jean-Antoine now. So Jean-Antoine, uh, so it is clear for us, I think that neurosciences are not just a biology. This is clearly more. And uh, they address uh, some aspects uh, that are specific to the functioning of the brain, computation, neural code, creation of internal representations, etc. This is far uh, beyond uh, uh, biology. In what way the new knowledge acquired in this domain is likely to transform neurology and psychiatry? If you may elaborate a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, f f first of all, I would like to point out that any cell, any living cell, is already a computing organism. It's, uh, I mean, the brain is specialized, but it's not. It's part of biology. The computing, I think. Anyway, the um, uh, the uh, it's true that there are a huge progress in this area, and I think there are several levels at which they can be very useful for um, uh, neurology and or psychiatry or. Uh, one is um, uh, the, the fact that uh, by having uh, complex um, uh, um, uh, models and understanding of the information processing in the brain can allow to understand how symptoms are formed in, uh, in, in disease. When something is going wrong, why does it result in particular symptoms? For example, um, uh, thought distortion or uh, um, uh, any kind of um, uh, um, uh, cognitive uh, in, uh, disability. We need to have this bridge between what is going on at the level of the circuits or the cells and why is it resulting in specific type of symptoms. So I think the, um, uh, um, uh, the cognitive neuroscience and, and, and uh, Computing is very important for that particular aspect. Another one is it may lead to ways of uh, improving symptoms, like right? because if we understand what are the mechanisms which lead to some particular dysfunction, it is perhaps possible to act on them using uh, techniques of, for example, brain stimulations, including non-invasive brain stimulation. So these are areas of, in which there are progress which are uh, very active. 
And um, so this is one. Another aspect I, I already alluded to is the, in the uh, in the brain machine interface in relation with, um, uh, for example, sensory deficits or alterations in specific um, uh, um, um, specific injuries like uh, motor paralysis. If we uh, and and scientists are becoming more and more able to understand to read the neural code to read the, the activity and perhaps. Uh, also to stimulate um, uh, downstream uh, to replace what has been damaged. And this is a very practical way of um, uh, an application of understanding the, uh, the uh, computing basis, if uh, you, you I may say so, uh, of the neural system, how it computes. So it's possible to perhaps to, it's already starting in practical terms, but it's possible to replace it in some instances. One has to be very cautious. There is a lot of hype in this area. And I, will, I would like to warn against all these uh, uh, fake news which are uh, circulating, but there is real and very excellent work done in this area, opening new avenues. Thank you, Jean-Antoine. So in the same line I have, of idea, I have a question for Martin and for uh, uh, again. So neuroscience became really uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, during the last decades. And how can true interdisciplinarity be fostered, encouraged in that field, not only between basic and clinical research, but also embracing other suitable disciplines like engineering, informatics, humanities. What is your vision about all that? Uh, Bernhard, if I may start, uh, I mean, you've seen I've quoted Sidney Brenner, who recognized the importance of new technology as a driving element in research. And I gave a couple of examples, including single cell transcriptomics, genome editing, and optogenetics, uh, just to name a few. So, so definitely facilitating a close exchange with groups focusing on methods development is important. Uh, in my view, and we haven't talked about this so far, informatics, in particular bioinformatics, is likewise critical given the rapid growth and complexity of data on one side and also the expanding opportunities that emerge from, from new algorithms for data analysis on the other side. In, in my experience, having experts in biomedical informatics um, on board is essential for almost any research operation. And of course, this equally applies now for, and we've talked about this, artificial intelligence. As, aside from involving such expertise, I think we need to work even harder to make open access and data sharing the rule rather than the exception, really. And we shouldn't forget about the requirements of uh, computational power and options for long-term storage of source data, um, also for interdisciplinary use. Uh, you've asked, well, how can we achieve a high level of interdisciplinarity? I, I guess the best way to accomplish this really is uh, to bring people from different fields in immediate contact, uh, as is the case, for instance, here in Munich, in the Munich Cluster for Systems Neurology, where people from very different fields, including experts in engineering, methods development, uh, basic research, clinical research, and also pure physicians all work under one roof. So in the very same building, in my experience, true Interdisciplinary research requires close contact and also people moving out of their usual comfort zone. And usually people don't want to do this, so they're hesitant to move out of their comfort zone, but such collaborations can be incentivized by providing targeted funding for collaborative projects that span different research fields. Now, uh, regarding the integration of humanities, so fields like, uh, I had to look this up, linguistics, uh, law, literature, and philosophy, that's what, what humanities means. I'm not sure I'm the right person to, to give an uh, advice on this, but it seems obvious to me that uh, the study of uh, language starting from language acquisition to language comprehension and also language production, so really language as a topic, for instance, is highly relevant in that the topic draws on methods and theories from multiple fields, including neuroscience, linguistics, cognitive science, uh, neuropsychology, and, and even evolutionary genetics, if you think of Svante Pebo's work, for instance. So how Aeronet could bring these fields together, I don't know, but maybe a good starting point would be uh, to define a, a topic and like language development and work on a specific call that invites all these disciplines. Th these would be my thoughts. Yeah. I, I think okay. I can only, only briefly add, because Martin has said most, I have the same experience with interdisciplinary centers at our university. 
And um, I think uh, also it's very important uh, to include the different disciplines in the calls. However, I think uh, one should be pretty open and just give the requirement uh, to include maybe one or two disciplines uh, outside of the own discipline in such a call. And then it's open uh, and depends dependent on the topic, whether it's philosophy or uh, whether it's a core facility for RNA-seq, uh, uh, genome sequencing, etc., etc. So I think one should rather be open, but one should uh, really uh, put conditions into these um, calls to include other disciplines. Thank you, Proke. So uh, now I have a question for uh, the Professor Berger and uh, Professor Gorhoud. So, so as you know, there is a growing body of evidence that indicates that the functioning of the brain depends deeply on its environment. The body, of course, uh, our microbiota, the society. So, Bess, for you, what are the new challenges that research on brain environment interaction must explore? because of their potential impact on neurology and the psychiatry. It's difficult. So I do not uh, know who wants to, to, to start, maybe Thomas or Philippe. Yes, of course, uh, I can start. So I think uh, from, my, uh, or from my opinion or from my standpoint of view, the major challenge regards the distinction between true causality from mere associations. So this is something which is a really challenge because all these potential environmental influencing or triggering factors are rapidly moving targets. They are highly volatile and dependent on a plethora of variabilities. So I think uh, despite the accumulating um, knowledge, as you mentioned, uh, in fields of epidemiology, genetics, immunology, but also I think uh, social cultural backgrounds, um, I think this um, in, uh, uh, environmental factors for brain fu function or also pathologies, this is really highly eligible for broad collabora uh, collaboration. And this definitely includes, to my opinion, uh, specifically also methods of artificial intelligence and cognitive systems. And you, Philippe? Yes, thank you. And thank you also for the remark of Martin about this difficulty to cope with these uh, very specialized basic centers with the uh, clinical research of every day, which we like to, to cope together. But, but to my view, we have research which is exactly the same level of complexity for clinical research. You know, just one psychiatric disorders, you can have a score which you are usually above the threshold. But now this is not what we're doing in our expert centers. What we rate is about the lifetime process, the repetition of assessments, the early childhood risk factors. We add also the assessments of endophenotypes, which helps to disconnect all those clinical heterogeneity. And at the end of the day, we gather millions of information on simple patients. So what you raise as a, a, a limitations for me is a strength we need to disentangle this complexity of mental health disorders and cope it with all the complexity of the markers that we might have for basic research. And the only way, I mean, the price to pay would be very simple, is statistical power, which means usually huge amount of patients. And that is probably the best way to face two aspects that are so heterogeneous, so difficult to, because so many facets that it really need a big, big samples. I'd just like to finish on one example that we had very recently on a publication in Cell, where we had half a million patients with psychiatric disorders with their GWAS, because that's one thing that exactly, as you said, Martin, is so easy to share now. And when you do that, you are then able to have a very precise idea of the overlaps between psychiatric disorders. That was for us a very nice example where we use a large amount of data describing patients with psychiatric disorders and use very sophisticated techniques that definitely generate thousands and thousands of information. Thank you. F thank you, Philip. So, so normally it would be the, the time uh, to, to open the discussion to the audience, but in the chat box, I have not seen uh, yet any questions. So uh, in order the audience can prepare some questions. So I, I will ask uh, to, to, uh, some question to Jean-Antoine. Uh, 
about the animal model. So let me explain. So medical research in neuroscience relies very heavily on the use of animal models. Can we do without animal models? And uh, do we have reached the point where other relevant models should be seriously considered and it can be used for replacement? I mean, uh, organoids uh, in silico studies. What do you think about and what is your position? And I will ask two of the others also to, uh, to contribute. Yeah, thank you for this important question. The, the, obviously, uh, um, um, neuroscience and, and uh, the um, aspects of neurology and, and psychiatry interested in, in understanding the mechanisms, we need a model. We need to study nervous system. And these studies have to be done experimentally. So this is something which is absolutely uh, necessary. So it's, in terms of models, it's, it's possible to uh, draw very important information from simple nervous systems, such as uh, the worm, the fly, uh, the fish, etc. But we need also to study complex nervous systems, such as the one in mammals. So it's absolutely necessary. And th sometimes, uh, as you said, people think of replacement when they talk about organoids or they talk about um, um, uh, models and uh, in silico models, etc. But uh, uh, and they are not replacement. They are uh, um, additional approaches which should be done in, in, uh, together with the experimental approaches to explain uh, better the experimental results, to uh, uh, as help to ask the right questions during experiments. To, uh, so it's, it's not um, uh, possible to replace uh, the animal model. This is something which is uh, uh, at the heart of uh, neuroscience and we cannot study nervous systems without gathering new information. We have also to realize that in spite of the amazing progress that has been made, we, know, we still know very little. So um, the, 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 we have much more to discover. I and mean, without studying the actual nervous system, it's just impossible to do so. And I think those we think we can replace um, uh, uh, experiment, uh, animal research by uh, in silico models or organoid, it's just, it's not possible. It's, um, they are very beautiful, very interesting, very powerful models, but they are complements, not replacements. Thank you, jean -Tone. We will pursue this line of, it, of discussion if you want with uh, the other uh, panelists. Uh, so, of course, we know that uh, there is some debate about the possibility that animal models can re recapitulate uh, the human disease. So, uh, Thomas and Philip, what are the major problems you identify with the animal models uh, now? If you may elaborate uh, for one, one minute each, maximum, if possible. I, can, I could do that very quickly because uh, we, we use it very frequently in psychiatry. It's extremely important for us. Of course, it's, it gives a limited amount of information. I completely agree with what has been said. Uh, we, we have more information for us for primates rather than rodents because complex human behavior is more easily to, to see in rodents. Uh, we know also that these use of rodents is expensive and limited, so not always very easy. We use it most for addictive disorders because you can replicate very easily addiction in, in rodents, but, but there is no doubt for us that it is absolutely needed. Uh, just, just to add what I said before, it would be even better for us if we had the availability of brains of patients that had psychiatric disorders, because then uh, this kind of translation approach using the animal motors to get to human beings would be much facilitated. Thank you. Yes, uh, I also agree what has been said. Uh, that we kind of replace our animal models, but I think there are definitely two um, pathways already um, are given. The one is, I think, from an ethical standpoint, of course, we need to uh, search for alternative experimental models instead of animal models, not replacing, but as we heard before about complementary. And the second point is that, of course, in many uh, disorders, specifically neurological disorders, uh, the, the animal models are at best proxies to the human condition. So this also requires, I think, appropriate alternatives or complementary models. And this could be, and this is my personal opinion, that I think that, for example, brain tissue, either by uh, neuropathology up to organoids on the one hand, but also I think we should um, 
uh, hard, uh, uh, work hard on really virtual models. And I guess that our uh, deep learning uh, abilities will also have a next step into virtually modeling um, neurobiology and uh, pathological conditions in a virtual way. Yes, uh, Martin Frauke, do, do you wish to, to bring a, a something uh, to, to this discussion? Yeah, I think um, we are always talking about uh, translation and um, uh, maybe this is really too simple. Maybe we should talk about B-directional translation, uh, which means really coming from the basic to the clinic, but also uh, backwards from the clinic to the basic. And I think, um, or, or, or one could call it uh, then reverse translation. I think you really need both in the mm -hmm. end. And I'm very happy in neuroimmunology that we have so many animal models which uh, do not cover the whole human disease but aspects of the disease and if you put really the 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 individual um for the individual question if you put the right approach together be it the animal model or be it uh, an organoid or uh, be it the patient or the csf of a patient uh, etc and um, i think it's uh, only important that you really know of the limitations and that you pronounce these limitations but uh, if you draw the right conclusions out of uh, the models you are using and if you combine models i think that's uh, i think we should we should just stop this whole discussion i don't uh, think we should be really dogmatic on the one side or the other side we have to link both Thank you, Frauke. So I think that the time is running very, very fast. So just you are entering the very end of, of this panel discussion. So Anna, do you have uh, seen uh, some question? If not, I will move uh, to, to the speaker again. Just uh, uh, about Bernard, just one brief comment on this, if, 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 if you permit. I th for me, the clue is triangulation of evidence here. I agree you need all, all these models and you need human models as well. But the, what builds confidence in my mind is you have evidence of gene from genetics, human genetics, you have evidence from observational and interventional data, and you have the animal evidence. I think we have to look at it you know, from various sides at the very same time and try to obtain triangulation of evidence rather than building on one single model. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. So I have not seen a question from, uh, from the audience. So I have a, just a very uh, a question to all you five. And uh, just a very, very, very quick answer. What uh, can you tell us in a few words what you do expect as a matter of a dream from neuron specifically? It's a very difficult question, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just one comment, perhaps. One thing which appears very clearly from all what has been said is um, one major challenge in the field of brain disease is to have many different people uh, having different approaches, talking together uh, and being able to understand each other. So I think that Neuron, by uh, making a, a, a very strong effort to have uh, this interaction between uh, neurology, psychiatry, clinicians, and also uh, uh, neuroscientists, and also other uh, disciplines, as was mentioned, is really going in the in, in this right direction. So uh, we we and neuron by um, supporting the best possible research in this area at the interface and the crossroad between these various disciplines is extremely useful. So I think this uh, crossroad hub uh, um, role is very important. I yes, completely agree, definitely with Jean-Antoine, it's an absolutely must. We, we really benefit of the progress of the other fields on brain research and psychiatry made a huge amount of progress just recently and we hope to continue this way also thanks to uh, Neuron. Thank you. Um, I also would like to add that um, if this discussion uh, mirrors 
um, the thoughts and the pathways of neuron, then I think uh, we're uh, ending up with the right call slash questions and therefore format for research calls because then this can be fostered by the call, this interdisciplinarity and also this uh, fostering of young uh, uh, neuroscientists uh, to get the right answer. So this is something which is very important to steer uh, the right call, the right question to get the right answers. So if Falk and Martin has nothing to add, uh, as the time is over, uh, we can move to the last slide of the session. And uh, I wish to express my gratitude to Martin Falk, Jean-Antoine, Thomas and Philippe for their contribution to this uh, first round table. And now I give the floor to Anna Gossin.